Welcome back to Nick Lenz's Comic Corner Classic Slash Non Classic. This is episode number 700 and, no, 700, 890 and 784. Mm -hmm. Yep. This one I'm reviewing two Inhumans trades. First up, it, this is basically I have here volumes 1 and 3. For the series Inhuman. I have previously reviewed volume 2. So now I'm talking about the first and third volumes for the series. And yeah. And here's something interesting though. This series was not very long. And these two trades are the only two trades left for the series. Though there is a, sta a separate trade related to this one. Where it has the Inhuman special. That was part of a three part annual. That was part of a three part crossover between Inhuman. The, the human. Amazing Spider-Man, and I believe the other one was, oh yeah, it was Captain America, Sam Wilson, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the first trade, Genesis, which, yeah, this book has debuted this character, Lash. And I talked to Ryan Segman about him, and he actually doesn't, he actually liked the look that they gave Lash. He didn't say much, much about the actor who portrayed Lash on TV. But yeah, he's actually the only one who's a who's a creation of Charles Show to ever make the live action. But he's not the only character made deep in this in this in these five issues. We also have this character in the bottom. This is a character named Dante, whose code name is Inferno. We also have a character named Flint, Nydia. They basically make the debut in these in these issues. We also see the debut of the reader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also in these issues we see a guest appearance by Captain America in issue. Three and in issue five, it's Thor. Yeah, actually, actually, uh, actually, scratch that. Captain America showed up in issue two, and Thor showed up in issue four. Yeah, Captain America showed up for a very good reason because in the first issue, Medusa was still staying in the Avengers Tower since the Avengers Infinity, and then with the next issue, she's set up the set up New Atalan, an island in the middle of Manhattan. Though, if you read Death of a Human series. For some reason, it's off the the humans are off planet and on some other world. As far as I can tell, it was never explained how the heck they got there. There are many unanswered questions related to death of the humans. But yeah, let's talk about this. Now these issues are noteworthy for one particular thing. Actually, it's for six issues of the series. Yeah, with not only Charles Show doing the writing, but also artwork by. Joe Midoriya, who does the first three issues, and Ryan Stegman, which I actually have to meet this guy. He does issues four through six. He does pretty much a majority of this series. And it's kind of like a 15... It's basically a 15-part story. Though it has some loosely connected stuff related to it. This era... The, the, these first six issues suffered through a problem that apparently... This is actually one of two books actually did suffer through this problem when this book came out in 2014. What was the problem? Delays! Yes, my gosh, there was delays this damn book. Like, the the first issue was supposed to come out in January, and here's something interesting, though. Originally, Matt Fraction was slated to write this book, and then for some reason he left. As far as I can tell, I've never met Matt Fraction, and I've never got... I, I've never met Matt Fraction, so I don't know what the explanation for why he left this book was. Because it was set up, he was going to do the book. It was supposed to come out, I believe it was supposed to be February. They come out to April. Yeah, and then... And then the, the, the next few books were delayed. Yeah, issues basically two through four. These three issues were, in fact, delayed. And then once issue five came out, the book finally came out on time. It took a while, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, eventually after a while, the book came out on time. Yeah, this is just basically the, just set up for stuff related to the human era. It just stayed up new status quo, and also the start of this era, which will last for three years. And these are fantastic issues. I actually own these issues, by the way. And this also features the return of the Unspoken. Yep, a character who, after the events of the storyline... He remains in prison for a long period of time. He remains in prison for about two years. Yeah, he gets finally let. He gets finally escapes during the events of a Humans vs. X Men. Yeah, that's when he escapes. Also, this is also in this very storyline when they have Gorgon going in his wheelchair. Yeah, in case you're wondering, like if you read all of the Humans, like when in the world did Gorgon go in the wheelchair? 
It happened in issue four of this of the, of the series. And he was in a wheelchair for a long time, like a good, I'd say, two years. He finally got out of the wheelchair at the end of the All New Human series. I'm sure James Amos probably convinced Charles Show that, yeah, we should get him out of that damn wheelchair. He's been in for too long now. He can still do this whole stomping thing, but he can't walk. So eventually he got himself a new, he got himself some, some cybernetic enhancement in his body. He was to get out of the damn chair. Yeah, great start to the series. And, yeah, give this book roughly a 9.5 out of 10. Really good. Though they also have the debut of the character Legacy, who would become a recurring character throughout this entire series until the events of this storyline. Le- lineage. This is Lineage. Yeah. Yeah, Lineage is also the name of a character who showed up, like, I think he showed up in issue 3 or 4. He gets to interact with some characters. And apparently he has connection to his... He has basically his human abilities that he can talk to his ancestors. Yeah, they also kind of explain somehow, and it's not thoroughly explained here. Apparently Karnak is inside of his body. Even I question, like, how the heck did this happen? Because last time anybody saw him, he jumped out of a window. Yes, he jumped out of a window. I mean, dead for a good year. Before the show was like, hey, Matt Fraction, the long part of this book. Can I bring him back? I guess Marvel gave him the okay. Of course, this book does contain the last three issues of Inhuman, issues 12 to 14, and the annual, which is the end to this series. Though it was continued as, it was relaunched as Uncanny Inhumans, which got canceled just two years ago after 20 issues. And it had an annual. We also had the All-New Inhumans title, which lasted for 11 issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, Black Bolt comes back to the series. Yeah, he after he last appeared in this series back in issue 8, he finally comes back. And also, she, uh, Medusa gets forgiveness for what happened during the events of Access, because this takes place right after Access. So she's forgiven by her people because she was not in her right mind. And she gets upset with Black Bolt, like you see in the cover. Over them set up two thrones because they she wanted he, he wanted to go back the way things were before the whole thing had been separated, and despite the fact she does still love him, she still hates what he did, basically blowing up her home. Yeah. As for what the perceived threat is, because this is mentioned by Lenny in this one, like there's a threat coming, but as far as I can tell, I don't think this was Thanos. No, I don't think a threat was Thanos. As far as I can tell, Shaw set this up, but as far as I can tell, it seemed like right after the events of the series ended, it seems like this was virtually ignored, and then Al Ewing picked this up in the pages, and apparently it took a Danny Codis picked this up in Death of the Humans. Yeah, something is coming after the Inhumans, and Black Bolt 1 increases population. As for the whole reason for this, it's not been thoroughly explained of why. I mean, Shoal never bothered to explain it. It's like he forgot about this plot point once government launches on Canadian humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this this is really good. Ryan Stegman here continues as the artist. He does a, he does basically issue 12 and the annual. Why not? Because he did most of the series. So issue 4, mind you. And, and, and issue 13 and 14 by Andrea... Andre Ajaro, I think I found that person's name. The Ryan Simpkin does all the covers in here. Yeah. Though, of course, in after the events of the first five issues, Medusa pays last visit and informs him about the whole thing with Black Bolt. Because even though that she's an enemy of New Atalan, he, he's still an inhuman. And he didn't want, she didn't want to keep him in the dark about this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Also, apparently... Edrald the door, yeah, the inhuman door, which t- sends it, sends it to various places like like this with, with Lockjaw. Yeah, for some reason this this particular thing was put on top of a robot and walked around for a brief period of time and then removed his own head. Yeah, I'm not really sure what show was going when it comes to this. Mm-hmm. But yeah. With this particular, with, with, with the end of this, this wraps up pretty much most of the, the threads that have been going in humans. Well, not everything. Yeah, I'd say most of the plot threads related to this series have been pretty much wrapped up by the end of the series. But there's still one thing that the Charles Show never wrapped up. 
Of course, give this book a 9.5 out of 10. Yeah, there was one thing that the series never bothered to explain. What the threat was that Black Bolt was preparing for. Yeah, as far as I can tell, this threat has never been delved on. I mean, if you read in Candy Humans, this plot threat is never even mentioned at all. Yeah, it's never brought up there. Apparently, Danny Cotas apparently brought this up. Apparently, it's some serial killer. Maybe. But this big threat that Shoal was preparing for, either one, he had a kibosh because of Secret Wars. That's a possibility. Or two, there really was no threat at all. Yeah. The one thing I appreciate, though, about this tree right here, the the first slime, they actually have, like, in the back of the tray, they actually have a good tracking of where the Terrigimus Cloud is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I at least gotta give high praise for this tray for for putting this in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is basically how the Terrigimus was basically going at this point. Yeah, this was like this up until, like... Well, the whole thing with the Terrigimus Cloud, that was a plot point as far as I can tell. That was a thing that Hickman did. Shoal had nothing to do with it at all. Yeah, that was all John to Hickman thanks to Vince Infinity. Yeah, and the Terrigimus Cloud went on the planet for like four years before Marvel was like, hey, let's get rid of this thing via bomb that was created by Moon Girl. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people think that was quite stupid of all characters. Why did that be Moon Girl? Why couldn't it be, I don't know, Ray Richards, Forge, Beast? Yeah, Beast have been researching a cure. Yeah, and of course the whole thing, now it was revealed after scores, that apparently the Terrigen Cloud was poison to the mutants. Because here's the thing, prior to this Terrigen Cloud like, go around the planet. It's been explained that apparently it never affected the mutants at all. In the case of this recently, the reason why it was killing out the mutants was because of the poison in the atmosphere. That was basically a combination with Terrigimus, and that's what was killing them. Yeah. I'm like, really? Okay. Though, the only reason why Marvel decided to do this thing is because Marvel wanted to give a push to the humans. A group of characters who Marvel has tried to get pushed over the years, but not as big as this. Yes. Now, I'm not pointing the blame at Charles Show for all the stuff that related to humans. And I'm not pointing at John Bankman, though he did kind of start the whole trend of the humans getting a big push. I blame Marvel editorial for that. Yes, I point the blame at them for the forced push that the humans got. Though, execution-wise... The human books are all really good. My friend Tibby is not really a fan of these books. I don't know if he's actually even read them or not. I have no idea. Though I do agree the whole thing of the humans and the action of each other. That was quite stupid. Yeah, that was stupid. But in the case of this, these two traits are really, really good. I thoroughly enjoyed them reading them again. Like re reading these issues again because I own a majority of the series in single issues. Excuse me, and it's just, just a damn good series. Now, in the case of it ending at this particular point in time, I'm fine with it. It's, yeah, it was an ongoing series. It was kind of a 15-part series, mind you. It wasn't, a, let's say, a maxi-series. It was definitely ongoing. Marvel treated it as such. I don't think it was canceled low sales. I think it was became, I think it ended. And here's my theory of why it ended. My theory of why this series ended when it did is because of Secret Wars. You want to know why? Because anybody remembers this very well that happened at the end of every single Marvel book that was coming out just prior to Secret Wars. We had this logo right here. This logo appeared at the end of every single Marvel book just prior to the Star Secret Wars. Though the next Inhumans book would not be until, like, there was a Candy Inhumans Humans that they released issue zero. Issue one to come on to October. Yeah. And they did release one Inhumans miniseries, Inhumans Atalan Rising, which I think, yeah, Shoal did write that too. But as far as I can tell, that's one of two books, I, one, two, 
two of the things I got left to go when it comes to Shoal's run for the Inhuman books, which is a very good run, mind you. Despite what people say about the Force Push to Inhumans, at least that their books were actually really good. Yes, really good. I thoroughly enjoyed these books. They're not terrible books. I don't get why people weren't just, just barely giving these book characters a look. I mean, these are characters like the X-Men who are creations of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Get these characters a second look. That's what I recommend when it comes to reading the humans. I mean, yes, there are humans traits aside from the stuff the show did. I mean, there's the Royals by Al Ewing. There's the Humans Judgment Day. There is the Black Bolt series, which was actually done by... I don't remember the, the writer's name. It's This guy has also taken over... This writer also just took over the, the Miss Marvel title. The, the, this, this is actually a concern. Issue 38 comes out. Mm-hmm. And there's also the Paul Jenkins and the Jay Lee run from 2000. That has been collected in trade. There's also the original run from the, from the 70s. That's also been collected in trade. And I know for a fact that the third volume for the series... That was that came out roughly in mid two thousand. That's collected in Fantastic Four trade, mind you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the stuff related humans is really good. There's even a trade that collects some of their early appearances. I do recommend checking that out too, because you could check out the, the the human saga. And here's something really interesting though about the early appearance of the humans. They their appearances stop briefly because debut Galactus. That's basically the way it was when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and plus, this group has has a has has a connection to the Avengers, due to the fact that at least one of its one one of, one, one, one person associated with the Inhumans, Crystal, has been a long-standing member of the Avengers since 1970s, though she's not part of a team since like the 1990s. Yeah, or last time she appeared as part of of an Avengers roster was back in the 90s, because. Apparently, no writer even bothered putting on a damn roster. Bendis didn't do it. As far as I can tell, Jonathan Hickman never did. And as far as I can tell, Mark Wade never bothered with it. Al Ewing. No other writer has ever put it like... They, they, they did put one human on the Avengers roster, and that was Gary Duggan. That was a new character. But as for Crystal, who is an Avenger, has not been Avenger since has not been a team since 1990s. Medusa herself has been part of Fantastic Four. Though she was briefly part of Fantastic Four. She filled in for... Heck, Crystal even filled in for her when... Filled in for Sue Storm when she was pregnant. Medusa filled in when Reed and Sue were separated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I don't really get... Now, also, they also had Trigon himself appear in, in Namor comic books. So, yeah. These characters appeared everywhere. They're not just in their own book. I mean, heck, these characters show up on the pages of Spider-Man, of all things. And yes, these characters also have a connection to Fantastic Four due to the fact they have frequently appeared in the book, and also the fact that Johnny Storm was dated both Black Bolt's wife when they were separated and dating Medusa's younger sister. Yeah, dating two Inhumans. Yeah, and plus Crystal is the mother of... Quicksilver's only child. Yeah. So, I don't get why people hate the Inhumans. Is it, in my theory, though, I think the reason why people don't like the Inhumans is because of the force push they had to go through from 2014 to 2017. That is just my theory anyways. Me? I don't hate the Inhumans. I love the Inhumans. I think they're great characters. I just think they should get a little bit more respect. At least, at least... Give these characters a second look. There's plenty of trades out there that collect their stuff, okay? So, that's it for this particular review. Stay tuned for my review of two Spider-Man trades. You'll find what they are in the next episode, okay? But do see you next review. Bye.